seen in Chama, New Mexico, is happier as a double-headed train pulls out for Cobra's Pass. With my UAG number 487, and my friend Ethan, AG number 489, double-headed run to Combrace. Climb to Combrace. same time that this train is going east out of Chama, another train is heading west out of Antonito, Colorado. This is the Cumbres and Toltec Scenic Railroad. When the Rio Grande abandoned the narrow gauge mainline out of Alamosa, the states of Colorado and New Mexico stepped in and bought the scenic 64 miles of the route from Antonito to Chama attempt to save a part of this historic line for future generations to enjoy. <laughs> Traveling west out of Antonito, the train begins the long climb towards Cumbres Pass. Leaving the arid San Luis Valley, the train weaves back and forth, climbing along every hillside in an attempt to gain elevation. The route is so circuitous, in fact, that between Antonito and Chama, the railroad crosses the New Mexico-Colorado border 11 times. One of the main reasons that the states purchased the line was because of the diverse scenery and railroading along it. It's an unusual stretch of railroad. Uh, no one lives uh, anywhere between the two terminal towns, really. It's uh, a very long stretch of 64 miles. Nothing in between the two terminal towns. And it was largely that way when the Rio Grande ran it. This is probably the neatest river in the country. It's my driver. It's got a wide right, variety of uh, terrain. Earl. And he char he's charged for my engine number 487. Terrain. We got the steep climb out of here. There's an easy But we'll see him again at Chama nice in 1991. All worry, all white snow clouds uh, will be going to open clouds snow at Combrace, all the way to Wack Tunnel. We'll see that this program. Here's the engine number 47. Here's the engine kind of thirsty, but we'll make a stop with the first of the stop. At Sublin, Mexico, this is called the Ghost Town. So from the next call, the train was train stopped for water. The passengers can now been stretched his lane, judge their lane. stops for water, allowing the passengers a chance to get off the train and stretch their legs. Sublet is an abandoned railroad maintenance town. Here track crews known as section gangs live full time. At one time there were eight such locations between Antonino and Chama, where each crew was responsible for the upkeep on their assigned section of track. Today Sublet is one of three remaining section camps. After the passengers are done wandering through the ghost town, the train climbs onward into the mountains. Now we hit the large stop at Orger, Colorado. The Cattle Park engine number 484 will meet him there at Orger, Colorado. So now we head onward into the mountains. Today's train suits the needs of the modern tourists very well. It is a far cry from a train that the Rio Grande once ran, the San Juan Express. The uh, passenger train was running at that time, 
on a 200 mile daily run from Alamosa to Durango. The equipment had been rebuilt in the 1930s and was very comfortable. They had a railway post office, express car, a baggage car, one or two coaches which uh, had very modern type seating, including settees, and a parlor dinette car on the rear which had a small stainless steel kitchen presided over by uh, a colored gentleman who uh, did uh, great honors to the profession and in a, uh, a setting with four persons boy you could order a, a minimal menu and uh, if you do the day or two in advance you were going to ride the train you could place orders for whatever kind of steaks you wanted in San Juan which we put back in service after re rehabilitation in 37 was literally anything that was running on the standard gauge anywhere in the United States at that time. It was a, it was a little darling. I don't know what happened to the mail contract. That was the only thing that really kept it going for the last few years was the mail contract. Yeah. And baggage and mail, see. And we, uh, it got to where I've been on that train. I was working on that train when we had two passengers. Uh, one of them was a pay passenger, and all must have come, and the other was riding the pay. That's all he had on there. The San Juan Express ran until January of 1951 when it was abandoned, despite the fact that the Rio Grande was offered more money for its mail contract. It wasn't making any money. It was losing money. And uh, I was astonished to learn that... Uh, the management had turned down offers from the post office department to increase their pay just to keep the train on because eventually after it was gone it cost the post office department three, four, five times as much to provide mail service to the same places. I still think people enjoy the, probably enjoy the CATS, the Wrangell and Silverton, but frankly we were if the people then had the money to throw away like they do now and was willing to pay to even even a small portion of the fares and rode the train as religiously as they do now, we'd still have an arrow gate probably, at least with a fashion train between Alamosa and Durango. The San Juan has been gone for over 30 years, but today one can ride a train over the most spectacular portion of the route, Toltec Gorge. Along this portion of the line, track surveyors chose to locate the railroad along the sides of the mountains instead of down in the valley. This is the scenic highlight of the trip from Antonito. The open gondola car is filled to capacity as the train winds its way west. Along this portion of the line can be found the only two tunnels located on this section of the Rio Grande narrow gauge. So the first tunnel is a mud tunnel tunnel edge of mud. And then we'll have to walk tunnel next. After passing through the first, known as Mud Tunnel, the train goes west having left New Mexico and momentarily returning to Colorado. The area is largely inaccessible and the size of the setting becomes apparent as the train snakes its way along the mountainside and heads back into New Mexico. continues its climb going ever higher into the mountains. Now train goes to Rock Tunnel. Soon, Rock Tunnel is reached, and after it, Toltec Gorge. Also located here is a monument to President James Garfield. A memorial service was held at this spot when news of the president's assassination was received. All the time that this train has been traveling west from Antonito, the double-headed train has been fighting up the 4% grade from Chama.
portion of the line has always been a helper district where extra locomotives were stationed to help boost trains over Coombers Pass. here are all veterans of the line. The K-36 class 480s have all spent many years toiling here, a job that they are well suited for. They do their job, but they do what they're asked of them. You know, they're, uh, they're a freight locomotive, there's no question about that. They weren't designed to go fast and pull heavy trains. They're quite happy hauling tonnage trains at 12, 15 miles an hour, but that's about what you can ask them. You try to go any faster than that, that's you're asking for trouble. That's the Highway 17. Oh, you can sit down for a minute or two, and then you got to get back up, shovel six or seven scoops of coal, and an hour and ten minutes come up the hill, it's two and a half minutes. At Coxall. The trains are still heavy going up the hill out of Chandler, and you know, you're doing pretty much maximum tonnage for one engine. You're working the engine to its maximum capacity, so you got to watch your water real carefully when you're going up, because the water level is very critical in a steam locomotive. If you don't have enough, you can pour yourself sky high, and you're using quite a bit going up that hill. We use about, oh, 2,500, 3,000 gallons on the climb to the top of the Great Pass. Parkville and Highway 17, and the train will pass at the Windy Point. They're coming, though, they're coming. Approaching Coomeris Pass, the train goes by another famous narrow gauge name, Windy Point. Windy Point. The Bolva engines whistles to alert Coombrace and know they're coming. Double engines whistle to learn Cumbrains to know they're coming. That that is coming. They're coming. In a couple of minutes, the train will arrive at Coombers Pass. Coombers Pass. The mere mention of the name will grab the attention of railroaders and rail fans alike. When Robert Richardson took this photograph, Coombers was still a busy place. The San Juan has just stopped at the depot prior to departing for Chama. The snow shed in the background covers a Y used to turn locomotives around. Today, Coombris is but a shadow of its former self. The depot was torn down before the San Juan even quit running. The snow shed is a sad case. It was intact when Colorado and New Mexico purchased the railroad, but funding problems with the two states failed to preserve it from the cruel winters on the pass. The car repairer's house is in disrepair. Another house is about to cave in. Even the section house, although in good shape, is boarded up after a gift shop inside closed. Although there are preservation problems at Coombers Pass, one can still watch as the train starts the long downhill run to Antonito. Bye bye, my friend. Have fun in the last and all here. Take care now. It's gone. It's going away. <sighs> at the Great Horseshoe Curve at Los Pinos, there is preservation taking place as the 100-year-old water tank is being refurbished. is the last place one has to watch the train before
or it disappears into the mountains. Midway along the railroad is the former section camp of Osier, Colorado. The beautiful windswept Osier is a lonely place. It is a favorite area for ranchers to leave their cattle to graze for the summer. And this leads to some amusing confrontations. Today, the eastbound train from Chama is first arrival in. So, at Orger, the train from Chama meets the train from Atenido, Colorado. So we're going to swap trains while the passengers have lunch. It's time for lunch. Pastor. The train from Chama meets the train from Antonito. Your engine counterpart, engine number 484, is waiting for your train, number 487. You could get uncoupled the train from Antonito, and I'll take the Chama, then your engine will take the Chama train back home to Chama, Mexico. The counterpart, engine number 44, will take the Antonito train home, charges home. While the passengers have lunch, the locomotives exchange trains. This arrangement is unique in that passengers can make a round trip halfway to Osier and return on their own train, or they can switch trains and see the entire railroad returning to their original point of departure by van. During the lunch stop at Osier, passengers have the chance to ponder the historical significance of the railroad that they are riding. It is no accident that the railroad was saved. After the Rio Grande ran its last train through here in 1968, the people of the area banded together in an effort to save the railroad. In 1970, they convinced the states of Colorado and New Mexico to buy the line from Chama to Antonito. Today, the railroad is leased from the states by Kyle Railways, which operates it as a tourist attraction. Dan Ranger is Kyle's general manager in Chama and is charged with not only running a railroad as a business, but also preserving a western landmark. This is not always easy. It's a terribly difficult thing sometimes when you get caught up in the business portion of the business. I mean, you know, you, you, get, you get bottom line orientated, as they say. And you have to sometimes step out of those shoes and say, all right, now wait a minute, all right, can you do this? Is this, uh, is this appropriate to do this in a historical sense? And sometimes you find it is not appropriate. So you have to find another way of doing it. Kyle Railway's agreement with the two states is that Kyle is responsible for only the equipment that it uses in its operations. Thus, a great deal of the buildings and cars that make up the museum collection are not covered by that agreement. To fill this vacuum, the New Mexico Historical Society has stepped in with a volunteer restoration program. Twice a year, members journey to Chama and go to work, in this case restoring old gondola cars. It's a labor of love. I like railroads, that's the first and foremost, and uh, I, uh, I was kind of grew up on the narrow gauge. I, my parents brought me up here when I was really young, and I've been coming up here ever since. And I just don't want to see this stuff rot to, you know, uh, complete junk. And uh, that's what I'm doing now is trying to keep it from doing that. There's not money uh, enough from the states. This is the Spencer Wilson. The is not responsible for equipment he doesn't use. And so we have what is museum quality equipment, uh, rolling stock and buildings, and it's, somebody's got to take care of it. Although the volunteer program goes a long way towards preserving the museum collection, Ultimately, other steps will have to be taken to preserve and upgrade such areas as Coomer's Pass and Shama. Everybody agrees that the snow shed should be restored back to where it was at least in 1970. Uh, and uh, there's no money. 
and that would take uh, heavy equipment, uh, and I don't think volunteers could do it. In time, given the financing and the funding, uh, as it becomes available, we can see a considerable amount of improvement on the railroad, not only in the, in the, in the normal maintenance and the rest of those things, but also in the, in, in the restoration of the uh, buildings that are, are gone now, like the roundhouse and some things like that. I would like to very much see that sort of thing happen. It can be state funded, but it also could be funded through uh, foundations, uh, i.e. Uh, people like Forbes, Coors, uh, people like that. Despite the lack of funding for historical restoration, Kyle does a good job maintaining the equipment that it is responsible for. Just working on the locomotives is hard enough. We take out the greases, the oil, you name it. Think of Phil. So this is Phil Fillmore. He's a worker the for the Chama New Mexico work dump they're, engines. So they look real simple, but then they're hard. They are hard. But then they're beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> in Chama is the Coombers and Toltec's new engine shop. One of the few places in the U.S. where heavy steam locomotive repairs are still done. Here is Selbrush, engine number 4 and 8, he needs some repairs on the engine before he could go out on his journey. Back out on the line, a low locomotive acts out one of the most historically authentic scenes on the railroad. A helper returning from Coombers to Chama, as has been done for over a hundred years, the locomotive eases down the hill with no tourists, no photographers, just history. Now you're in engine number 47, and he's, he's turning home. He's turning home to Chama. I woke up very hard with the heavy train, so I head back home to rest. is done and the two trains are going their separate ways and this is what happened in 19 the train passed through the Mayapol's 321 so he's he heading home to rest after he get this unloaded passage from the train for China as the Chama train goes toward Cumbres and passes milepost 321, the location of a daring rescue during the winter of 1951-52, George Kingery remembers well the rigors that railroaders worked under as they fought the railroad's worst enemy, snow. Started in 51 in December, it was stuck up there, and it was way up in 52 before, until we got them all out. We was up there, uh, we left out of us, uh, on January wow, the uh, 20th, deep snow. 1952, wow. and we didn't get to Tama until uh, February 1st. Wow. It's only 92 miles. Mm -hmm. First day you went to, went past Anita, went to Anita and then started up the hill. But then uh, you might say about 10 days from Anita to Tama. Engine 491 had just finished with helper duty and was returning to Alamosa when the snowstorm hit. Engineer Joe Dalla and fireman Johnny Lira were buried in engine 491 when it was hit by a freak avalanche. John Norwood set out from Coombers on snowshoes trying to find the lost locomotive. I left uh, Coombers about 4 o'clock in the morning. Finally, about 12 hours later at mile 321 after bucking the blizzard and wind and snow, wow. I found the engine 491. Everything buried except the about a foot of the smokestack. And uh, as I walked by over the drift, Johnny Lear had just they kept the tunnel open to get ventilation and to get in and out of the engine. Just as I got in the right place downwind, Lear had come to the top of the tunnel and threw away a dispose of a shovel full of ashes. And that's where I found him. While Norwood was rescuing the crew, the Rio Grande had the ultimate snow fighters closing in from Alamosa and Chama. 
the rotary snow plows. We decided to blow it open it up there with the rotary. And about, it takes about three engines. At least, we used to have at least three engines. Or sometimes they had more pushing the rotary, you know. And uh, we'd get up there where you had to uh, run out of water in the section and show it was still in the tanks. The heavy snows are no longer a problem for summertime tourists on Cumbres. As the Chama train crosses Lobato Trestle near Chama, the passengers get a final look at mountain railroading. <laughs> at the other end of the line, the Antonito train charges home. is amazing. I can best describe that by, uh, by what a friend said to me the first year I was here. It was uh, in the middle of the year of 1983, and I was talking to him about some business. And he said, how's it going? Finally, we completed our business. He said, how's it going? And he said, oh, pretty good. He said, uh, you do know what you're doing there. And I said, yeah, I'm trying to run a railroad and try to, you know, improve the place. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, the next time that you're out or by yourself sometime, and so the train is about to leave, he said, you stand there and watch it, and you think about it a little more. And I did that one rainy September day, and the train left town with a double header, and uh, like a fool, I stood out in the rain, and I watched it go by, and then I realized what it is that you're doing. The Cubras in Toltec and the Durango in Silverton were once the same railroad. Today, the lines are firmly established with their own identities. They are both living museums to the time when narrow rails wound their way through the Rockies, uniting isolated mountain communities with a growing nation. She's going for 80. She's about to put the turn to head back to Durango. To Durango. It's full train. From Silverton to Durango. So very well, the house. But there's more coming up. So the train has a course at the water tank at Hermosa, our next landmark in the Dean journey. February 1987.